thank you, Brother Falls, for that good special number. And I would mention that some of the words to that were particularly apropos for the beginning of our lessons tonight. Now, he's going to pass out our lesson this evening. The words that he sang to see if you're willing to open the door, oh, how he wants to come in. The Bible teaches this very plainly. Now, please listen. The Bible preaches that any man, woman, or child who will receive Christ as Savior, who will recognize the fact that they are a sinner, who will understand the fact that they cannot save themselves and there is no good that they can do, no way that they can merit eternal life, who will understand that Jesus Christ died as a sacrifice to sin, that He shed His blood on the cross in place, in my place and your place, in place of all mankind, that anyone who will believe that and personally trust Jesus Christ for salvation will be saved. That is one of the most fundamental truths of the Bible. That there is no one that is beyond the reach of God's salvation. That there is no one that is born into this world that exists outside of the pale of the love of Christ. That there is no one in this world that is God desires to send to hell and to damn for all eternity. But that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, He died for the sins of the entire world, and that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now to us who come to Faith Baptist Church and hear that preaching and, and that sentiment ringing in the music that we sing and the special music that we enjoy in the choir numbers that are sung here, in the uh, messages that are preached from the pulpit, that emphasis is placed in the invitation as we call people to make decisions for Christ, as we call them to turn in saving faith to Christ. To those of us who come to Faith Baptist Church, that uh, is indeed a very basic and fundamental tenet of our belief. In fact, we would be surprised and shocked if anyone would claim to be a Bible believer and yet take the position that only a certain few could possibly be saved and that there are folks who, though they may come through the doors of this church, may hear a gospel message, may hear an appeal to be saved, that they could not, for some reason, turn in faith to Christ. We would be shocked by such a teaching. But there is such a teaching that exists in this world today, and for lack of a better term, we call it Calvinism. Now, I'll get into the history of it uh, in a subsequent lesson, but take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 10. I want you to see some things in the Bible right away. We're going to base, of course, all of our remarks in this lesson series on the Word of God. Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, and I want you to turn to chapter 10, the middle chapter of those three. Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 deal with a very, very important topic. Uh, Romans chapter 9, however, is often misrepresented as dealing with election regarding particularly God's choosing some to be saved and some to be damned. Now, eventually, I'll go through the whole chapter, Romans chapter 9, with you. Suffice it to say tonight, though, that Romans chapter 9 is talking specifically about God's choice of Israel as His chosen people. Okay, understand that. And no, no unbelievable harm has been done, incredible harm, untold harm, has been done by those who misinterpret and misrepresent the teachings in Romans chapter 9. Recently, I heard a Baptist minister make this statement. He said regarding Romans chapter 9 and verse 17, he made this statement concerning the Pharaoh. You'll remember Pharaoh of old in Israel, or pardon me, in Egypt, hardened his heart against the children of Israel. Following his hardening his own heart, the Bible says that God hardened his heart. Now, you'll know, please, if you'll read in the book of Exodus, that he hardened his heart first, and then God hardened his heart. The initial hardening of heart was done by the Pharaoh, not by God. But if you'll read in Romans chapter 9, verse 17, and we don't have to, you can look at there if you want to glance there for just a moment. Romans 9, 17 talks about the Pharaoh and how God used the Pharaoh as an example of how God would judge the enemies of His chosen people, Israel. That has absolutely nothing to do with God selecting who would be saved and who would be damned during the church age. Absolutely nothing. But this particular individual, he interpreted it that way. In his zeal to press this interpretation upon Romans chapter 9, this otherwise sound preacher made this statement. He said, now listen carefully to these words. This is a direct quote. 
He said, God wanted the Pharaoh to sin. In other words, in not allowing the children of Israel to go. God wanted the Pharaoh to sin. I want those words to sink in. I don't know if they affected that audience the way they would have affected me had I been sitting in that audience live. God doesn't want anyone to sin. That is one of the most basic precepts of the Bible. And to say that God wanted the Pharaoh, or anyone else for that matter, to sin, is to say that somehow God is the author of sin, or that God has preordained that certain individuals will commit certain sins. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. This is what helped to spur on, by the way, the the series of lessons that we're covering now. Look at Romans chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. Romans 10 and verse 1. In the midst of uh, this passage that is often misrepresented as some form of of, of an election and a damnation passage, Romans 10 verse 1. And the Bible says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Paul desired the nation of Israel to turn to Christ. In chapter number 9, he had dealt with the fact that Israel was God's chosen people, but that Israel had rejected the Messiah. In their rejection of the Messiah, they had rejected Christ. God set them on the shelf. But in chapter 10, verse 1, Paul says, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Verse 2, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. What did they do? They rejected righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. They rejected their Messiah as God prophesied that they would. God, who knows the end from the beginning, prophesied that they would. They rejected their Messiah and have attempted to establish their own righteousness through the works of the law. Verse number 4. The Bible says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now I want you to notice that. To everyone that believeth. Everyone. Everyone. Everyone who believes experiences the righteousness of Jesus Christ. There is no limit on those who can believe. The word everyone is an all-inclusive and all-encompassing word. Everyone who believes can experience the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. That is a teaching of the Scripture. You might want to emphasize the word everyone, but but we go on. Uh, Verse number 5. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. All right, there is a sense in which the law was God's moral standard for righteousness. They were to obey the law. But, verse number 6, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend up into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. In other words, faith says, I don't have to bring Christ down from above in order to believe. I can believe without without seeing Him. Verse 7, Or who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. I do not have to see Christ present. I believe this is what faith says. What is the word of faith? Verse number 8, But what is it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Now please listen to these verses. They're familiar. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on Him shall not be ashamed. You might want to underline the word whosoever there. Whosoever means anyone. Anyone who believes will not be, the same, will not be ashamed. But verse number 12 clarifies it further. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. Notice the two words all in verse 12. No difference between Jew and Greek. Now, the argument in chapter 9 was this, that God's chosen people, Israel, had hardened their hearts against Christ as their Savior and had rejected Him. Paul says they are not permanently separated from God's program for the ages. 
as we know that Israel will not be permanently set aside. The Jew is the focal point of God's plan for the ages. But during this time period, since they rejected their Messiah, we're living in the church age, and God is, according to Romans chapter 11, grafting in the, the wild olive branch into the domesticated branch, the domesticated line representing Israel, the wild branch representing the Gentile. In the church age, God is dealing with a Gentile bride, but Israel is still part of God's program. The Bible tells us in the book of Zechariah that there will come a point in time when a nation shall be saved in a day, when all of Israel will turn in saving faith to Christ. When Jesus comes back at the second coming, the Bible says they will look upon Him whom they have pierced, and they will believe as a nation. So God is not done with Israel, but He is dealing with the church age today, and that is, that is me and you. That is our time period in which we're living. Now, so he says in verse 12, with that background, there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. Verse 13, if it's not underlined in your Bible, it should be. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You say, preacher, who does whosoever include? According to verse 12, it includes both the Jew and the Greek. The term Greek there is not speaking of an ethnic Greek from that, uh, that uh, country in Asia Minor per, se, Minor per se. It is speaking of Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles. If you are not a Jew tonight, you are a Gentile. Who can call upon Christ then for salvation? Everyone in the entire world. There is no difference between ethnicity. There is no difference between racial background. There is no difference between culture and tradition. There is no difference between whether a person is high-born or low-born. Everyone and anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, please listen carefully. That means when I preach the Gospel on a Sunday morning and I give an invitation and I urge people to come forward, there is not one person in the audience who could not, by making, putting their personal faith in Christ, and we have folks come forward and pray, lead them to the Lord at the altar, there's not one person in the audience who could not be saved. The Gospel is preached. They have an opportunity to turn in saving faith to Christ. Where you say, Preacher, this is so simple. We all see it that way. No. And that's the problem. Outside of the walls of this place, there is a huge group of people who do not see it as we've just outlined it from the Bible. There is a large movement of breast in evangelical circles that is adopting an extreme view on something that is called Calvinism. Calvinism is a dangerous and unscriptural system. Now we're going to get into exactly what that system is in a moment. The essence of Calvinism, and please listen carefully, the essence of Calvinism is this, that every Thing. Everything was preordained by God. That means, if I can illustrate, I've got a box of, I've got hymn books up here, but that would hurt. I've got a box of Kleenex tissue here. According to the Calvinist, whether I hold this box in my hand or whether I drop this box is not my choice. Now, I'm being very simplistic here, but I want you to understand something. It is already foreordained whether I will hold this hand or whether I will, about this box or whether I will drop it. It's, all, it's been foreordained. It is decreed from eternity past, and I have no choice in the matter whether or not I hold this box of Kleenex or drop it. What do you think I'm going to do? What? What do you think I'm going to do? You think I'm going to drop it? No, I'm not. Put it back in the pulpit. Now, <laughs> tricked you. Now, that's a silly illustration. You said, preacher, see, you didn't drop it. It was foreordained that you would not drop it. God foreordained you wouldn't. I know I'm, be I'm being facetious here. I'm trying to explain something. This Calvinism thing goes beyond election to salvation. Please understand. It goes to the every decision or movement that is made by an individual. And there is a teaching that everything an individual does has been foreordained to the extent that he has no choice in the matter. Now, I want you to let your mind run just a little bit for a moment, please, if you would. That means then that when I sin, I was foreordained 
to sin. No. Do you know why I sin? I sin because I have a flesh nature. And I sin because this old will of mine sometimes follows along with that flesh nature. And sometimes I get in a place of temptation. And I'm not going to blame God for my sin because I am personally responsible. You say, well, Pastor, this almost sounds like fatalism. I'm glad you said that. Fatalism. You say, what is fatalism? Some, by the way, we use for Calvinism sometimes the terms predestination, foreordination. And those are good terms. Some of them are Bible terms if they're understood. I hate to have stuff laying around the church like this. It bothered me the whole time I was preaching if I didn't put it back. Uh, those terms are good terms and they're Bible terms and we will define them according to the Bible. But there is an extreme position that has been taken regarding these terms that has confused people. I was reading as a preparation for this study... Lorraine Bethner's book on Reformed Theology. I was telling someone a moment ago, if you ever can't sleep at night, please buy a copy of Lorraine Bethner's book on Reformed Theology. It is about this thick. If you cannot sleep at night, it will, it will move you to sleep faster than Tylenol PM ever could. Okay, So if, you, if you're an insomniac, you get your copy of that book. But in reading some of the remarks in that book, it is interesting. Uh, Bethner is considered the authoritative spokesman of Reformation theology. Uh, he wrote the book in the early 1900s. In his book, he drew a, an interesting parallel to Calvinism and Islam. And I'm not going to get back on the Islam thing, but of course my eyes just about popped out of my head when I saw this parallel. Uh, Bettner said in his book that Calvinism is echoed in heathen religions, including, he uses the word Mohammedism, we'd call it Islam today, uh, including Mohammedism or Islam, he said it is echoed in Islam and literally millions of people believe in the same type of predestination. Now let me ask you a question. Is Islamic fatalism Bible Christianity? No, it is not. Now do you know why the... the well, without getting off too far. Okay, here we go. In Islam, the teaching is this, that Allah cannot sin because everything Allah does, whether we determine it to be good or bad, is good, regardless of what it is. And that everything that takes place is the will of Allah. So that when those airplanes flew into those buildings, that is not considered a tragedy by anyone who is an orthodox Islam believer because it was simply the will of Allah. Now that is what is taught in the Quran. That is what any, even a mainstream Islam would teach, that that is the will of God because it was predestined to happen, it was foreordained, it was fatalism, and they believe in a Loctite fatalism. Lorraine Bethner, Professor Bethner, who wrote this book on Reformation theology, he is the ultimate authority. He understood the similarity between the Loctite fatalism of Islam and Calvinism. And when you read the definitions, ladies and gentlemen, there is essentially no difference in the ultimate outcome. Calvinism is an extreme. It teaches that God has foreordained everything, including sin. May I say, ladies and gentlemen, that there is no Scripture anywhere in the Bible that says that God promotes men to sin. I've got to get into the lesson. I'll never get there if I don't. Look at your lesson, please. A closer look. Why teach a lesson regarding Calvinism? You kind of have an idea of what it is. In essence, by the way, it teaches that some are preordained to be saved. Some are preordained to be damned. There's nothing you can do about it. It was merely a roll of the dice. It was God's choice. Uh, and uh, you may, if you were born in this world preordained to be damned, you could not be saved. That is what Calvinism teaches. Why talk about this? Number one, increasingly large segments of the professing church both tenaciously hold and vigorously promote Calvinist doctrine. Put the word promote there. Vigorously promote. I am watching this more and more. I'm seeing it and hearing it from pulpits. I am listening to it in radio and television preachers, and I am hearing of it in seminars and books. It is more and more promoted. Point two, some Reformed Christians. Now let me define the word Reformed very quickly. You say, preacher, what is a Reformed Christian? 
A Reformed Christian is somebody who adheres to one of the Reformation denominations, the denominations that sprang from the Reformation. Uh, Presbyterianism would be an example of that. Lutheranism would be an example of that. These are denominations that gained their prominence. They were maybe founded by great Reformers. We call them Reformed denominations, and they came from the Roman Catholic Church. Typically, your Protestant, many of your Protestant denominations are Reformation in their belief. You say, well, preacher, aren't we Protestant? We're Baptists. No. No, we're not Protestant. We're not Protestant. You see, the Protestants came out of the Catholic Church protesting against the Church in the 1500s, roughly speaking there. They came out protesting the corruption of the Church, the doctrinal aberrations of Catholicism. They left and they were reformers in that they wanted to reform and come up with a different church that didn't have the same representative corruption as the Catholic Church. You say, well, where were the Baptists? The Baptists went by different names during that time. They were called Anabaptists. They were called Waldensians. They were called Donatists. They were called Moravians in different countries. They were Bible-believing people who held simply to the authority of the Bible apart from the authority of any hierarchical church, and they were separate from both Catholicism and the Reformation churches. Martin Luther himself, the great reformer, made this statement. He said, were it not for the persecuting arm of the Roman church, the Roman Catholic church, the Baptists would swarm over the countryside like flies. Luther understood that there were Baptists in his day. We're Baptists. We're not Protestant. We never protested anything. We come from a long doctrinal line that had nothing to do with that. Point two, look at it. Some Reformed Christians believe that, quote, Calvinism is pure biblical Christianity in its clearest and purest expression. And I've given you the reference there where you could find that quote. Well, now, wait a minute. If that's true, then we should sign on, shouldn't we? But we're going to see in, in the future lessons as well as this that that is not the case. Point three, popular Reformed preachers are increasingly emphasizing the tenets of Calvinism. I've listed two. Now, Dr. Kennedy and Dr. Sproul are both Christian men. They're both Christian men. I have especially very high regard for Dr. D. James Kennedy. I like to listen to him preach on TV sometimes. I enjoy his preaching. He is a Presbyterian and a little bit of an old school Presbyterian. However, he is Calvinistic. Now, please listen carefully. There are extremes in every movement. There are some who are mildly Calvinistic and the teachings of John Calvin hardly affect their belief system. That, those people are essentially uh, innocuous when it comes, they're more benign when it comes to the issue of Calvinism. I would probably place Dr. Kennedy as one of those, uh, less, less extreme on that uh, particular point. There are others, however, who are rabid in regard to Calvinism and take it to its far logical extreme and are very, very dangerous. In Dr. Kennedy's defense, for example, though he uh, is a Calvinist and uh, does have strong beliefs regarding predestination, you'll hardly hear a preacher who is more evangelistic if you've heard him speak. Normally at the close of his telecast, there is an invitation uh, for people to be saved. He is the man who authored Evangelism Explosion. Thousands of people have been saved through that ministry. But here's what Dr. Kennedy said. He said, I'm a Presbyterian because I believe Presbyterianism is the purest form of Calvinism. I'd just rather be a Baptist, amen? <laughs> I, I want to be a Baptist because I believe being a Baptist is as close to being a Biblicist as you can get. And by the way, the name Baptist never saved anybody. Don't think there's something sacred about that name. Please understand, your Baptist name tag is either going to fall off when you go to heaven or it's going to burn off when you go to hell. Nobody ever got saved because they were a Baptist. But I'm a Baptist because I believe that being a Baptist is as close as you can be to, to following the Bible. I like being a Baptist, and besides that, we all know John the Baptist was a Baptist. And so <laughs> that was a joke, okay? Uh, another um, Reformed professor, uh, teacher, radio teacher, Dr. R.C. Sproul, again an Orthodox man. He's a famous radio preacher. He's continually, however, pushing Calvinism on the radio across the country. I've had several members of this church ask me about Dr. Sproul's radio broadcast. I don't hear him regularly, but I've had several ask me about it. Uh, some of the extreme views. Again, we're talking about the extremists on this uh, that are sometimes promoted. Those would be two national figures. So I feel like since they're promoting this in their national ministries and since people are asking questions, and a number of folks in this church have asked questions, I thought we'd better do a series on it to understand where we stand in regard to this issue. Point number four. 
Reformed Calvinistic leaders are increasingly attacking non-Calvinist brethren, even passing resolutions against them. Now this was interesting. This was interesting. Uh, London, England in the year 2000, there was a group that met called the Alliance of Reformation Christians, and they presented a vision for biblical unity in the modern church. Among the resolutions that they passed, was a resolution that read as follows. Please listen. Quote, We bemoan the influence among evangelicals of a pietistic dispensationalism. Ert, put the brakes on. Pietistic dispensationalism. Welcome to Faith Baptist Church of Avon. Uh, that is exactly what we are. You see, pietistic, that means, uh, that it means having an experience with God, knowing God through the Word. Dispensationalism, what is a quick definition of that? Here, now listen, listen, listen. Interpreting the Bible literally. Now please, this is the fulcrum. This is the crux of the issue. We believe in a literal interpretation of the Scripture. Those who adopt reform theology uh, through the reformers who got this through John Calvin essentially was the chief spokesman, though Luther was equally rabid, uh, who got this from Augustine, who is Augustine, an early church father. We'll deal with him, the father of Roman Catholic theology. All of these men came out of the Catholic Church. These men, having come out of the Catholic Church, carried some tenets of Catholicism with them. There's no question about that. They carried some with them. Uh, and part of their interpretation is to take the Bible and to change its meaning or to spiritualize or allegorize it. Now, here's what we do. As Bible-believing Baptists, we read the Bible and we take it literally. Therefore, when I read, for example, and by the way, my, my Sunday school class is dealing with millennialism right now, when we deal with uh, the kingdom, the kingdom of God on this earth. Uh, well, where is the kingdom, pa Pastor Monty? The, the Bible in the Old Testament promises a kingdom. Jesus in the New Testament spoke of the kingdom. Where is the kingdom? Here's my answer. The kingdom is yet to come. The prophecies regarding the kingdom in the Old Testament have not met with literal fulfillment. The prophecies regarding the kingdom in the New Testament, Jesus, all of the discourse, and others, have not met with literal fulfillment. You say, preacher, when will the kingdom come? The kingdom will come following the tribulation period. The rapture of the church, tribulation period, Christ's millennial kingdom. That is the outline of the scripture. You mean it will be a real kingdom? Oh yes, a real kingdom with a real king, the Lord Jesus, with a real throne, with a real capital, Jerusalem. Where will it be? It will be set upon this earth. And this earth will be a kingdom for how many years? The Bible says 1,000 years. You say, preacher, do you believe that literally? Yes, I do. Now, if I were a Reformed theologian, I'd have to shake my head and say, no, I don't believe that literally. I believe all of those specific promises about the kingdom in the Old Testament and all that Jesus had to say about the kingdom in the New Testament is really fulfilled in the church. Ugh. This ain't much of a kingdom. I tell you, when's the last time you looked out in the lobby and saw the lion lie down with the lamb? You haven't seen that. The Bible says in the kingdom age, the lion will lie down with the lamb. We don't, we don't see that. So understand, this is not the kingdom. But that measure of theology allegorizes and changes the whole Word of God. So that's important. Continue that quote. We bemoan, these folks said, these Reformation theologians said, we bemoan the influence among evangelicals of a pietistic dispensationalism in which the world is considered irredeemably wicked. Well, just read your morning newspaper to find that out. And thus hardly worth the effort of influencing and in which the only hope is supposed to be the imminent rapture of the saints. Put that word rapture there. Is the rapture of the saints the only hope? Yes, it is. Well, what do these Reformation people believe? They believe that if they can Christianize the world enough, they themselves will usher in some sort of a kingdom. This would be, we're talking post-millennialism here, that they would usher in some sort of a kingdom themselves by Christianizing the world. Let me ask you a question. Is the professing church succeeding at Christianizing the world? No way. We are losing the culture war, and we know that. We are losing a hearing in the United States of America as Bible-believing people. The, the substitution for Bible Christianity is some kind of a flexible system of values that is being fostered off, uh, foisted upon the American public. They're accepting that with the highest value of all being an all-inclusive tolerance which accepts all, excludes none, and declares that everybody is correct. 
impossible. Logically impossible. The other day when I met with Mrs. Saeed, this just comes back to mind because it was funny. And she said she believed the Bible was the Word of God and she believed the Koran was the Word of God. Okay, well that's silly because they can't both be or God's very, very confused if that would be the case. And, uh, and she, I said, well, I said, okay, if you believe that, I said, now the Bible speaks of Jesus Christ having been crucified. And I said, the Koran says specifically that He was not crucified. I said, which is correct? And immediately she said, they both are. Well, how in the world? Okay, now we're talking with someone that is off the rocker, okay? Uh, and I, so I pressed her. I said, no, 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 no. Don't, 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 don't give me that kind of gibberish. Which one? Which one? Which one? And finally, after being pressed, she said, well, the Koran's correct. The Bible's wrong. But there is a spirit of the age that says there should be an all-inclusive tolerance uh, we would certainly not. We would certainly not be in favor of that. We're so, in, in other words, we believe the rapture of the church is imminent, and that the rapture of the church is the hope for this world. So this group of Reformation people is saying we've got to put a clamp on people like us. Do you understand what I'm saying? They're saying we've got to put a clamp on people like us because of our beliefs. Point number five: Why teach about Calvinism? Point number five: According to Lawrence M. Vance, there has been quote of late a resurgence of Calvinism in the Southern Baptist Convention. The Southern Baptist Convention, America's largest non-Catholic denomination. This, by the way, I confirmed by uh, an independent uh, talk with a Southern Baptist pastor friend of mine. Uh, he said to me one day, we were talking together, he said, do you know what is the, the, the biggest controversy in the Southern Baptist Convention? And I said, well, I said, you guys have been fighting over whether the Bible is really the Word of God for, for the last 15 or 20 years or more. He said, oh, he said, no, we're over that. He said, we decided the Bible is the Word of God. Well, they still have trouble in the colleges, okay? There's still issues in the colleges. But, uh, but uh, he said, the biggest issue right now is Calvinism. He said, Calvinism is coming in like a flood. So this is another reason, because doubtless you'll know folks that are going to be influenced, to be influenced by this. Point number six. Among other problems, uncompromising Calvinism, and put this word in the blank, limits, limits Christ's atonement to the elect only. Now I'm talking about five-point Calvinism, uncompromising Calvinism. Among other problems, uncompromising Calvinism limits Christ's atonement to the elect only. Strong Calvinists view the doctrine of limited atonement as, as an absolutely necessary feature of Calvin's theology. More mild Calvinists, however, disagree with limited atonement, choosing to be known as four-point rather than five-point Calvinists. Charles Haddon Spurgeon would have been an example of these. Okay, He was four-point, and he was somewhat weak in some of the other points. So again, there are varying degrees of those who claim to be Calvinists. But if a man claims to be a five-point Calvinist, then one of his key beliefs is this, that when Jesus died on the cross, He did not die for the sins of the whole world, but He died for the elect only, those who would be chosen to salvation. Now folks, there is not any hint of that in the Scripture. No hint. Jesus, when He was walking and John the Baptist saw Him, John the Baptist pointed at Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And why would you limit the blood atonement of Christ? Was His blood, which is divine, was that blood not sufficient to take away the sins of the whole world? Was there some weakness in the divine blood of the Son of God when He shed it in perfect sacrifice for our sins? No, absolutely not. To believe in a limited atonement, which is applicable to only a small and select and elect group of people then, is to limit Christ's working in this world. Preacher, why is that significant? Well, let me ask you a question. What does that do for your evangelism? What does that do for your mission program? If you cannot walk up to anyone on the street and tell them that Christ died for their sins, you've limited your ability to be a witness. Several, uh, a few days ago, almost a week ago, I had an opportunity to, to give the Gospel to a lady at the hospital who is dying. She's still alive at a Methodist hospital, but she's fading fast. The doctors say there is no hope. When I went in to speak to her, uh, she had been very confused that morning, but she had kind of a lucid uh, hour or so, and I got to speak. It didn't take a whole hour, but I, uh, the lady's name is Patty, and I went to Patty's bedside, and we spoke together just as I would speak to anyone in this room. And I said, Patty, I said, I want to tell you the best news in the whole world. 
The Bible teaches that you're a sinner. That's bad news. Because of your sin, you can't go to heaven. You're not, you don't just get free entrance to heaven. Uh, but because of your sin, you're going to die eventually. Whether it be from this sickness or something down the line, you're going to die. But the good news is this, that Jesus Christ died to pay the price for my sin and for your sin. That all you need to do, according to Romans chapter 10, which we read just a few moments ago, that all you need to do is turn in saving faith to Christ. Patty, that means you need to trust Him. You need to personally put your faith and trust in Christ, believing that He died for you and receive Him as your personal Savior. When Jesus died, Patty, He died for your sins and He died for mine. Now wait just a minute. If I were a Calvinist, I could not have said that. Because how do I know? that she's one of the elect. How could I say that, Patty, I'm certain Christ died for you? I would only be able to say, well, Patty, now listen, if you're one of the elect, if you're one of those specially chosen, you might make it into heaven. What kind of assurance would that be? How could I witness to anyone? Of course, I didn't use those words because the Bible doesn't teach that. I said, Patty, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. And she said, Preacher, could I be saved right now? And I was able to say yes. And nobody told me she was one of the elect. She wasn't wearing a button that said, Hi, I'm one of the elect. <laughs> she wasn't wearing that at all. I was able to tell her Jesus Christ died for her. She bowed her head and she received Christ. I don't know but that she's in heaven right now. I, I checked on her yesterday. I haven't heard as of today. I don't know but that she's in heaven right now. But I know this. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I know this, Jesus said, Him that cometh unto Me, I'll in no wise cast out. I know this, that there's not one person born into this world that cannot turn to Jesus Christ for salvation and be born again. And it's simply an act of personal faith. Next page, point seven. Calvinism discourages soul winning, gospel witness, and missions because the elect will be saved regardless of human effort. Put the word human effort there, preaching or witnessing, to save them. The elect will be saved regardless, they say. It is unnecessary because they are preordained to be saved. If someone's preordained to do something, then why should I make an effort toward their doing it? They will do it anyway. Point eight. Calvinism requires the introduction of a host of secondary doctrines completely foreign to the Scriptures and based upon human logic to justify its teaching. I'm giving you one example. Example. Do you know that the Calvinist believes that one is regenerated before he can be born again? Some of them use the term born again. Some of them say you're born again before you can be saved. Spiritual, what in the world does that mean? Now, I'm not exaggerating this point. I'm not exaggerating this point. Any true Calvinist would admit that what I'm saying is correct. They believe this, that there are certain people that are chosen to be saved. These people do not know that they are chosen by God to be saved, but they just have been from eternity past. They're chosen to be saved, and all of a sudden, they're walking down the street just as a lost sinner, an ig sinner, an ignorant maybe of everything, having never heard gospel preaching perhaps. They're walking down a street, and all of a sudden, God notices and says, hey, there's one of the elect. I better zap him. So he zaps him, and the guy's born again or regenerated. But he doesn't know it. Now, this is Calvinist doctrine, folk. It's Calvinist doctrine. Well, you say, preacher, what happens to him? Well, he's just walking along, but he doesn't know something happened to him, but something did. Well, what happened? Now, the first time he hears the gospel, he'll be saved because he's been regenerated first or born again first. Folks, listen. Your being born again is an act of your personal faith in Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world. By the way, the world. Notice the world there, not just the elect. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him, not just the elect, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. What do I have to do? I have to believe. And God doesn't zap you apart from belief. Now, when you're, when you're lost and you hear the preaching of the Word of God, the Holy Spirit deals with your heart. He speaks to your heart. You get under conviction. We understand the ministry of the Spirit of God. But nobody is born again before they're saved. And yet that doctrine becomes absolutely necessary in this, this morass called Calvinism. And we'll get into more of that eventually. Point number nine, why talk about it? Some Calvinists have gone so far as to equate Calvinism with the saving gospel of Christ. Quote, Calvinism is the gospel, and to teach Calvinism is in fact to preach the gospel, said Arthur C. Custance in his book, 
the Sovereignty of Grace Presbyterian and Reformed Publishing Company. Whoa, ho, ho. Then because I'm not a Calvinist, am I not preaching the gospel? The gospel, ladies and gentlemen, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The gospel is not God chose some to be saved and some to be damned. By the way, the gospel means good news. Good news. Do you know it's good news to all who would, would be saved? It's good news to the whole world. Uh, when the angels came to announce the uh, birth of Jesus, behold, we bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, not just the elect. If the gospel is that God in eternity past chose some to be saved, and God in eternity past chose some to be damned, that's not good news for the damned folks. It certainly is not. It's not the gospel to them. It is meaningless to them. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to whom, preacher? To everyone that believeth. Now, is there a condition on the gospel? Yes, belief. Is there any such a thing as universal salvation? Everybody in the world will be saved? No, 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 no. The Bible doesn't teach that. Salvation is conditioned upon belief. But anyone can believe. Point number ten. According to Dave Hunt, quote, Calvinism requires interpreting common words and phrases such as all, all men, world, everyone that thirsteth, any man and whosoever will to mean the elect. You have to change all of those words in your Bible. It appears that a peculiar interpretation is required to maintain Calvin's doctrines. Okay, now let me quickly cover this. The primary error of Calvinism. I put this in bold print on your outline. Calvinism is an extremist view of God's sovereignty which completely denies human will and views the church to be God's kingdom on earth. That is a good definition, the primary error of Calvinism. I note the following statements, and we'll go through these, and I want you to think of these. These statements were all made by John Calvin himself, written, many of them, when he was just 26 or 27 years of age, in a series of books that have come to be known as the Institutes of the Christian Religion by John Calvin. Incidentally, they were written while he was still on the payroll of the Pope, but we don't have to discuss all of that. That's for next lesson. Note the following statements made by Calvin himself. Quote, God arranges all things. He has decreed that they are so to happen. All, put the word in the blank, all, A-L-L. -L. All events take place by His sovereign appointment. All events. I put in parentheses, would this include sin? Does God will man to sin? Calvin says, yes. Yes. This is extreme. Will Durant, who it, with his wife Ariel, is the author of the history of civilization, the authoritative volumes on world, uh, world history that I have in my office in studying this. Will Durant calls this Calvin's terrible decree. Will Durant, by the way, had no Protestant axe to grind. He was an agnostic Catholic. But he called, it, he called it Calvin's terrible decree that God has ordained everything to happen, including sin. Here's another quote from Calvin. Scripture clearly proves, Calvin said, that God by His eternal and immutable counsel determined once for all whom it was His pleasure one day to admit to salvation and those whom, on the other hand, it was His pleasure. Put the word pleasure there. It was His pleasure to doom to destruction. His pleasure to doom to destruction. Does this contradict the clear statement of Scripture, quote, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance? God's not willing that any should perish. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. We'll get to that verse in just a moment. Do you see this, folks? Understand something here. This is twisted. This makes God out to be a God who would create beings, then foreordain their actions, and then punish them based upon, his for, based upon actions He had foreordained. The Bible doesn't describe God that way at all. In my opinion, extremist, and I'm not to use the word extremist, extremist Calvinism will actually uh, impugn the, nat the, the nature of God. It will blaspheme the nature of God. Because it says that God Himself is unjust fundamentally. We would uh, recoil, our sense of justice would recoil at the concept of being punished for something that we were forced to do without any human will. 
And as we've demonstrated a moment ago, we all understand that we do have human will. This is, these are amazing teachings. By the way, many people who claim to be Calvinists have never read the Institutes of the Christian Religion. It's very lengthy. Uh, you know, so many people claim things that they've never read. I just understand that. People love to, oh, I'm this and I'm that. And then you ask them, well, have you ever read the book? <laughs> no, I never have. But someone told me that's what I am. And so that's what I am. Uh, so understand a lot of people don't even know that this would be part of it. Look at the next quote down. Calvin said this, Those therefore whom God passes by, He reprobates. And that for no other cause but because He is pleased. Put the word pleased. Because God is pleased to exclude them from the inheritance which He predestines to His children. No reason why God's just pleased to do it, Calvin said. Happy to do it. Pleased. It pleased Him. Are sinners really excluded from heaven and damned in hell merely because such pleases God? What about where the Bible says, quote, As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Ezekiel 33, verse 11. God takes no pleasure in damning anyone to hell. If a man or woman, boy or girl, go to hell, they do so choosing to do so because they will not put their faith in Jesus Christ. It may be that they've never heard of Christ, but that is still, in, in a sense, we get into Romans chapter 1, where they do have some revelation, where there is a possibility of belief in something greater than them, that God will give extra light, all of those things. We've talked about them numerous times from the pulpit before. God's not pleased to send people to hell. God grieves over people who are sent to hell. Understand the picture of God. Understand who God is. For God so loved the world. You are made in the image of God. The great injunction of Exodus chapter 20, which forbids killing, murder, thou shalt not kill. It forbids murder, capital murder. The great injunction of thou shalt not kill is based upon the idea that you and I are made in the very image of God. And the image of God in me is nothing that you should stamp out. And the image of God is you that is in you is nothing that I have a right to stamp out. And so God says, Thou shalt not kill. Would it stand to reason that the same God who has said, Thou shalt not kill because man is made in God's image, and you shall not stamp out the image of God on this earth, would it stand to reason that that same God who says, Thou shalt not kill, would take some delight and, quote, be pleased, in the words of John Calvin, to send sinners to a Christless eternity to writhe and to burn forever and to suffer the torments of the damned, and they have absolutely no say or choice in the matter? Does that make any sense? Taken to its logical conclusion, it certainly does not. And I think it is a grief that someone would say that God is pleased when lost people go to hell. He is not. And uh, the last one, the last quote, bottom of the page. Now since the arrangement of all things is in the hand of God, He arranges that individuals are born who are doomed from the womb to certain death and are to glorify Him by their destruction doomed from the womb to certain death and glorify Him by their destruction. Folks, now listen, listen. Those are the words of John Calvin. Those are not the words of the Bible. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Those are the thoughts of John Calvin. The Bible says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Doomed from the womb. That means from the time, from the time that infant child is born. If he does not have some mark of election upon his brow, he can grow up perhaps in a Christian home. He can grow up perhaps having heard gospel messages. He can grow up perhaps having listened to a gospel appeal. He can grow up perhaps having made a profession of faith. But if he does not have this mark of election, he will be doomed and damned for all eternity. And there.